So hi again, everybody. Uh, yes, this is me. I'm here in my office in Beverly Hills. Nobody is around. Uh, left my kids and my wife at home with the nanny. And I wanted to have total focus to uh, be with you today. Those four hours are precious. Those four hours are, um, you know, intense or intensive. We have a lot of things to cover and what's important for you is not just to acquire the information, but take some good notes, ask some good questions, so you can now take this information and apply it in your practice. Okay, and I'm going to start by uh, answering Mark's question. When we do the submergence of the root, when we uh, like to get some additional root coverage, Root coverage in terms of extraction, not in terms of recession. When we do that, uh, it can take about four or five days only for the soft tissue to cover. So wait a week or two before you do the extraction. And then the because you almost made your extraction a little bit more difficult, what you need to make sure is that you do you you use things like the Benex extractor, which I'm going to review and remove this root as atraumatically as possible. Okay. So, uh, we have a question from Aaron. Uh, restorative driven placement, what if bone does not allow? Do you graft first and wait three to six months? That's a great question. So, absolutely. If you have a site that is completely collapsed and completely deficient, don't, comp don't compromise your implant placement. Don't compromise it just to make the treatment go faster because you and your patients are going to pay a, pay a very hefty fee later on because you have a malposition implant. So yes, you need to augment the ridge first, wait for it to heal, and then go back. Sometimes it's part of the treatment. It's not a setback. Okay. So uh, Victor is asking... Did you consider doing a socket shield for that case? Actually, I did the case before I knew about the socket shield. And it would have been a very good case for socket shielding. And I'm starting to learn and experience how socket shielding actually works. Case selection is extremely important. Case selection is critical when it comes to socket shield. And if uh, the doctors in, in this course... I'm not 100% familiar with the socket shield technique. What does socket shield mean? It means we are removing the tooth except for part of the buccal root. And the idea is to leave a shell of a root connected to the buccal plate. So we are fooling the body in thinking that the, the tooth is still there, keeping the PDL. And that supposedly keeps the buccal plate intact from what we're seeing online and seeing in publication in lectures. And I'm starting to develop my skills in regards to that. Aaron, let me tell you one thing. I don't know if you've done a socket shield before or not. It's a very, it's a very difficult technique. It's a very technique sensitive procedure, at least in my experience and my opinion, because you are cutting the root, you're working blind, you're working inside the socket with long burrs and you don't really see, and we don't really know how much of the root to leave and at what height and do we curve it into the interproximal? And as you drill into the socket, it splashes water and blood all over. So it's very, very difficult to do. I'm not saying it's not possible, I'm not doing it, but it's difficult. So it's not it's not my the most fun procedure. Okay. Mark is asking, do you ever use alloderm in conjunction with implant placement instead of C if, instead of connective tissue? Absolutely. And I, I may be able to show a case. Uh, the advantage of alloderm is that it it's readily available. You don't have to have a donor site. You don't have to go through the learning curve of harvesting connective tissue. And number two, probably more important, it's very, very stable. It's extremely stable and we can uh, definitely um, have it readily available. Uh, the only precaution is make sure it's not exposed. It's not meant to cover recession on implants. It's meant to bulk up the tissue, create a better emergence profile. 
So uh, Kevin is asking, your images are very clear. What system you use to take a CT scan? Okay, so most of my scans are done with an iCAT because this is the radiologist I use and they use an iCAT. But in reality, all the CT scanners on the market are more than adequate to give you the good results. They're more than adequate creating the digital data to be used for guided surgery. So Kevin, you don't have to be too concerned about the CT scan. If your CT scan images are not very clear, if, I'm, I'm not sure if you have a scanner or not, or if you use uh, somebody, uh, a radiologist, they should be clear. If they're not clear, you have to look into scatter. Maybe you're dealing with scatter, maybe the patient moved, and you have to have some, some uh, knowledge or tools to be able to assess the quality of the scan. And because we are so close and we're buddies, we're friends, uh, for so many years, probably, I think we're friends for about 18 years, since 99. You can definitely show me some of those images and I can tell you if they're uh, acceptable or not. Because you're right, if your images are not clear, not just from an aesthetic point of view for a presentation, if your images are not clear, if you're dealing with scatter, you're dealing with uh, wrong information, you're dealing with artifacts. And these artifacts are going to trickle down to your planning. Okay? Okay. 